Hello and welcome to Databases for Museums. In this talk, I'll explain some of the basics of how to take your data from a flat spreadsheet to a normalized relational database. Since we're meeting online instead of in person, I think it's only fair you know who's talking to you. My name is Joseph Davis. I'm a career database administrator and database developer working mostly with SQL Server. I completed a Master of Science in Experimental Archaeology at University College Dublin in 2018. In addition to my usual database work, I'm currently volunteering on a project to digitize archives of archaeological material. Now, this talk doesn't assume any previous experience with relational databases or with any particular software. As you'll see, thinking about normalizing data is about logic. Ultimately, it's not about software at all. The software only comes in at the end of the process. The topics I'll cover will be what is a relational database and how does it differ from a spreadsheet? What are primary keys and foreign keys? What are data modification anomalies? What is database normalization? And how do the database normal forms help to prevent data modification anomalies? The database I used for these illustrations was Microsoft Access, which is the desktop database most people may have at least a passing familiarity with. However, these examples would apply to any relational database. Use what you have. No actual database modeling tools have been used in this talk. My preferred modeling tool, at least at the beginning, is still just a whiteboard. Most of the source data and examples are taken from Karen O'Toole's spreadsheet of Irish bog butters. Karen sourced this data from published papers, museum archive database entries for bog butter and containers shown to have held bog butter. For a few cases, the original spreadsheet was altered in order to illustrate specific design problems. For a few others, examples of design problems were created just for the purpose. The examples should approximate what might be seen in museum databases. So, now we really get started. What is a relational database and how does it differ from a spreadsheet? A spreadsheet organizes data in one or more sheets, which have rows and columns of cells. A relational database stores data in tables made up of a list of column definitions. Here's the spreadsheet, with all the data in a single table. The columns do not have enforced definitions. Uniqueness of rows is not enforced, and the same data is repeated in multiple rows for some columns out of necessity. In a relational database, you have multiple tables. Each table is composed of column definitions. These are things like the name of the column plus the data types. That may be a date, it may be a number, it may be a string of a certain length. Each table contains data about only one entity. The uniqueness of the rows is enforced, and each piece of data is entered only once. A primary key is a column, a field, whose value is unique, or a set of columns whose combined values are unique within the table. The primary key uniquely identifies each row of the table. A primary key may be meaningful and natural, a guaranteed unique name or combination of names, it may be a date in a table where each date can only be represented once, or a primary key might be meaningless and arbitrary, such as an automatically assigned integer or a unique identifier called a GUID. Having a meaningless number for a primary key has several advantages. The primary key for a row should never change as it may be used to establish relationships with rows in other tables but natural names of things may change over time. For example, the official names of museums, businesses, and even the names of people change. The primary key for a row should be unique under the broadest possible circumstances as well. A name which is unique within one domain may not be unique in all of them. For example, Dublin is a unique city name within Ireland, but there are six Dublins in the United States. Here's an example of primary keys in the natural world. This finds bag shows several possible primary keys. The number 17E0264 is the excavation code. 17 represents the year. E for excavation is only a separator. 0264 is the excavation number, in this case the 264th excavation granted a license in this year, well, in the year 2017. 52 is the finds bag number, which is unique within the excavation, so unique within the domain of the excavation. 12 is the context number, unique within the domain of the excavation. Here's an example of compound primary keys. 
Imagine an open-air museum offers demonstrations of ancient technologies and needs to track which demonstrators participate in which demonstrations. Each demonstrator may participate in many demonstrations. Each demonstration may have many demonstrators, but no demonstrator may participate twice in the same demonstration. The combination of demonstration ID and demonstrator ID is and must be unique, so demonstration ID and demonstrator ID form the primary key. So what are foreign keys? The primary key can be used to create relationships between tables known as foreign keys. For example, we have a table of counties and each county exists in one and only one country. And we have a table of countries in which the country ID is the primary key. By establishing a foreign key relationship between country ID and the county table, and country ID the primary key of the country table, the values for country ID in the county table are limited to the values of country ID in the country table. These tables can be joined again in a query or a view to produce the set of country names and county names. If the data in the country table changes, for example here where we've changed the name from the English name of Ireland to the Irish name of Ireland, the results of the same query we ran before reflect the change for all counties. Just to recap on primary keys, each row in each table in a relational database should be uniquely identified within the table by a primary key. Primary keys can be one or several columns, primary keys can be meaningful or arbitrary, and primary keys can be used to establish foreign key relationships to other tables. So, now, what is database normalization? Database normalization describes the organization of data into tables in order to prevent anomalies when data is inserted, updated, or deleted, and to allow for the addition of new kinds of data with minimal changes to existing data structures. An insertion anomaly occurs when some data cannot be inserted to the database at all due to the database structure. For example, if the container ID is the primary key of a container table and there is one column for the container type, a container with both wooden and animal parts cannot be entered as the table only allows for one type per row. An update anomaly occurs when values for the attributes of a single entity are stored in multiple rows. Then an update of some but not all rows can leave the values of those attributes ambiguous. For example, if each row in the table here represents one item of bog butter and the name of the museum that holds it is stored in the row, if the name of the museum is changed in some rows but not others, the name of the museum becomes ambiguous. The example here, we've changed the name of the National Museum of Ireland in one row from its abbreviation NMI to the full name National Museum of Ireland. So now we have two names that refer to the same museum. A delete anomaly occurs when deleting data describing one entity requires the deletion of data describing a different entity. For example, in the bog butter table, we have one bog butter that's held by the Royal Dublin Society. We have the bog butter ID, the name of the museum, and the phone number of the museum. If we delete the row for the bog butter that's held by the Royal Dublin Society, we also delete the museum's name and phone number. So what are the database normal forms? Each stage of normalizing a table, normalizing a database, is called a normal form. These are three of the first and most used. First normal form, in which a unique primary key identifies each row, and the values in each column are atomic, meaning it's only one value, no lists. Second normal form, the table is in first normal form, and every attribute in the table depends upon the entire key. In third normal form, the table is in second normal form, and no transitive dependencies exist. One more after that that I'll talk about, Boyce-Codd normal form, 
sometimes referred to as three and a half normal form, and no, I have no idea how that's actually meant to be pronounced. It goes just a bit beyond third normal form. It's usually as far as the database will need to go beyond some highly specialized applications. In voice cod normal form, each row's values are dependent upon the key, the whole key, and nothing but the key. Now we'll look at each normal form, its definition, some examples of it, and its advantages. First normal form. Again, the definition. A unique primary key identifies each row, and the values in each column are atomic. Now an example of first normal form. In the non-normalized bog butter table, each row represents one example of bog butter, but has no unique ID. In first normal form, each row has a unique primary key. We add the primary key, we're already in first normal form. The bog butter table has a list in the radiocarbon date column, showing multiple dates separated by semicolons for when the radiocarbon dating has been repeated for the same bog butter. To put this into first normal form, we break out the radiocarbon dates into their own table. The RC date table has its own primary key, RCID, and an ID column that contains the ID of the bog butter the state belongs to, and a radiocarbon date column with one and only one date in it. The ID column of the RC date table is a foreign key referencing the primary key of the bog butter table. The values for the radiocarbon dates themselves are still not atomic, as they consist of three internal parts, the year, the uncertainty, and the dating system, such as before, present, common era, and so on. To put this into first normal form, the parts can be stored separately in their own columns. Since all our dates in this bog butter table are BP dates, we can simply store the year BP in the uncertainty. If they were not all BP dates, we would have to convert them. By storing all dates as BP dates, the dates can be compared easily. By storing the uncertainty in the year separately, the dates can be compared as ranges. Breaking down the composite values into atomic values gives us more opportunities for data analysis that we wouldn't have without that. However, we're still not done. The dates can be broken down even further by modeling the date system itself. We have a date system table with an ID, a zero date, such as 1950 for BP dates, and a factor which determines which way from the zero date to count up or down. Dates stored with their original date system can then be converted with a simple function from one date system to another for comparison, and we can enter the dates as we originally received them. Now that we've got a handle on first normal form, what is second normal form? In second normal form, every attribute in the table depends upon the entire key. This seems intuitive with a single column key, but it may not be if the key is composed of more than one column. For example, we have the bog butter table, which contains the bog butter ID, which identifies each row uniquely. The museum information does not depend on the bog butter ID. Only the fact that a certain bog butter is held by a certain museum needs to be retained in the bog butter table. Before the bog butter table has been put in second normal form, no museum without a bog butter can be added, which is an insert anomaly. Updating museum data in one row wouldn't update it in the others, which is an update anomaly, and deleting a bog butter row would delete museum data, to delete anomaly. By storing the museum data in its own table and relating it back to the bog butter table through a primary key foreign key relationship, museum data can be inserted, updated, or deleted independently of the bog butters. Other than relieving us of the data modification anomalies, second normal form protects the integrity of our data by only allowing bug butter to be associated with an existing museum and not allowing duplicate names or other descriptive data for the same museum. Third normal form is where it starts to sound a little complicated, but it's really not. Third normal form eliminates transitive dependencies. A transitive dependency is when, for some A, B, and C, B depends on A, C depends on B, but C does not depend on A, and B is not a key. You with me so far? For this, we'll use the example of an open-air museum which holds demonstrations. 
Below we have a demonstration table with recurring demonstrations in it. You see flint napping and medieval cookery. We have a location table with fixed locations in it, a Neolithic shelter, an early medieval roundhouse, and we have a demonstration date location table which schedules a demonstration of a certain type in a certain location on a certain date. You see the demonstration title there, March XR Conference Flint Mapping Workshop, which takes place in March in the location ID 2, which is our Neolithic shelter, and its demonstration ID 1, which is flint mapping. Imagine this title might be what you would put in the calendar, or it might be what you would put for your promotions on social media. The demonstration title describes the demonstration on this demonstration date. It has a functional dependency on demonstration ID and demonstration date. As you can see, the demonstration title describes the March XR Conference Flint Mapping Workshop taking place on March 25th. It's demonstration ID 1. On our previous slide, we saw that that is a flint mapping demonstration. The demonstration title, however, does not depend upon the location ID. Since the demonstration title only depends on the demonstration ID and demonstration date, it needs to be moved out to a table which has demonstration ID and demonstration date as the primary key in order for this table to be in third normal form. Moving the demonstration title into a separate table protects us from a delete anomaly which would occur if the demonstration lost its reservation for that location and the row were removed. In voice cod normal form, each row's values are dependent upon the key, the whole key, and nothing but the key. For example, if we have one or more demonstrator that participates in one or more demonstrations on a certain date, one demonstration can take place in a location on a certain date, but no demonstrator can participate in the same demonstration in the same location on the same date. The tables here attempt to solve the problem by recording demonstrator ID, demonstration ID, location ID, and date in one table. Demonstrator ID, demonstration ID, and location ID are all part of the primary key. Demonstration date does not depend directly on the demonstrator or the location according to what we've defined. It does not depend upon the entire key. This could cause delete, update, or insert anomalies. An update to the demonstration date could put one demonstrator in two places at once. By modeling the following facts separately, demonstration date, meaning an instance of this demonstration will take place on this date, demonstration date to demonstrator, this demonstrator will participate in this demonstration on this date, and demonstration date to location, this demonstration on this date will be in this location. This shows a table structure which relieves the partial dependencies. First, the demonstration is described independently of anything else. What is it called? What is it about in the demonstration table? Then the demonstration can be scheduled in the demonstration date table. Now we know that a flint napping demonstration is scheduled for the 25th of March, and we can also schedule the same demonstration in the same table to take place on a different day as well. Each combination of demonstration ID and demonstration date is unique, so we can only schedule one of each demonstration on the same day. So the demonstration ID and the demonstration date together form the primary key. Now that the demonstration is scheduled, we need demonstrators. Assuming we have a list of demonstrators in a demonstrator's table, and each has a demonstrator ID, we can associate the unique combination of demonstration ID and demonstration date to a unique demonstrator ID, and all three values form the primary key of the demonstration date demonstrator table. There is also a column demonstration role in this table. This still conforms to Boyce-Codd normal form if it is true that a demonstrator might have a different role in the same demonstration on different days. Assuming we have a table of locations, each identified by a location ID, we can assign the demonstration to a location on a specific date in the demonstration date location table, independently of whether we have any demonstrators assigned. The demonstration date and demonstration ID together with the location ID form the primary key of this table. 
Notice that the primary key of one table can itself contain a foreign key to another table. Also, the uniqueness of the primary keys matches the logical constraints in the real world. Some final notes on normalization. It's unlikely that you will need to go beyond voice code normal form. If you do, there are also some other normal forms. Fourth normal form, in which there are no non-trivial multi-valued dependencies, which are not candidate keys or a superset of keys. Fifth normal form, a relation, meaning a table, cannot be decomposed further without losing information or creating false information when joining the decomposed tables. Domain key normal form. A database contains no constraints other than domain constraints, which are constraints determining what value can go into a column and key constraints. In sixth normal form, every relation or table consists of no more than a key and at most one other key or non-key attribute. Sixth normal form is absolutely the end of the line. It is not possible to decompose tables any further than that. In reality, few databases are like this and few need to be. In summary, ultimately, the process of database normalization is one of simplifying until further simplification is not possible. By following some simple principles, you can build databases which will be flexible enough to contain the data you have without compromising data integrity. A table is about only one kind of thing, a fact, an event. Every row in the table is about only one instance of that thing. Every column in the table relates only to the thing the table is about, the key, the whole key, and nothing but the key. If the same piece of data is stored more than once somewhere, determine what kind of thing that data describes and move that thing to its own table. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Please feel free to get in touch with me via email at fifthnormalform at hotmail.com or on LinkedIn, where my alias is also fifthnormalform, all one word, no spaces. Thank you, and stay well.